Does that get you in the spirit? Amen. That's what we're preaching from this morning, from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Let's stand together. And you can sing along if you so desire. The entire piece from Handel's Messiah on this one goes about four and a half minutes. So we just took the section out of the middle so you could hear all of that. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Thank you, Lord, to be in your house. It's good to worship with your people. It's good to know that God is on the throne. It's good to know that Jesus is his son, sent to be our gift. Thank you, Lord, for Christmas and Advent and this time of year. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I miss being with you, but I've worshiped the last couple of Sundays, and I want to say thanks to Mike for covering us on Wednesday and for Ian and Mary for preaching and covering on Sunday for us, for good reports on all three services. So, blessings. And you guys do so well without me, I didn't even want to come back. But, no, I wanted to be here. I thought about you guys, prayed for you while I was away. Advent is an English word from the Latin word which means coming. So Advent is the anticipation and soon arrival of a notable person, object, or event. So you can have things, for example, the advent of television, or the advent of the internet, or the advent of Jesus Christ. But the advent of television referred to the time when people anticipated and then participated in the arrival of TV and how it changed everything. It led to whole new industries and experiences like TV networks and sitcoms and videos and DVDs and gaming consoles, Xboxes and Playstations and all that stuff and news channels and advertisements and sport channels and shopping channels, yay, and movie channels and I mean you can find anything and everything if you get enough channels. I just never know what to do with 5,000 channels. Uh, there's usually about three or four that you watch, right? And so, anyway, who watches shopping channels? I, just, I don't know. Not nobody in this room, I'm sure, because we know that we don't have the money to spend anyway. So why look for things that you can't afford that you don't need? <laughs> but uh, there's even religious channels. I mean, how do you fill in 24-7 on religion? But they do it, and it just goes around the clock 24-7. I tune in sometimes to hear some singing. 
But you could think about that if, if we have all of that because of the advent of television. What about all that we have because of the advent of Jesus? How did it change the world? How many things now have occurred because of the fact that Jesus came? How much anticipation goes into it? Again, every Christmas season, Advent season, leading up to Christmas. And this season that we celebrate each year leading up to Christmas has special significance. It's twofold. It's focused on the coming of Christ, the anticipation of his first coming to earth, which we as Christians celebrate as Christmas. Then there's the anticipation for the second coming, Advent meaning coming, the second coming of Christ to earth, which Christians will celebrate eternally in heaven. Amen. So there's both that get involved here. So when you talk about the people waiting and longing for the coming of Jesus, and then we talk about we're still waiting and longing for the coming of Jesus. The two kind of go hand in hand. The same feelings that they had are the same feelings we have. But the, the issue is that as they got tired of anticipating, and probably some of them said, oh, it's just never going to happen, we need to be careful that we don't stop anticipating because it is going to happen. Jesus will come again. Before we left on vacation, I was preaching from Philippians. And the last passage we were using, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, is a very important passage by Jesus, uh, about Jesus. Paul was writing, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not count it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And taking the form of, of a servant, the bond slave, a slave, he came in fashion as a man and then humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross, the downward part of the V. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we went down and up that V of, of victory in Jesus Christ. And in keeping with this theme of Philippians, I can see again here in this Isaiah passage the humiliation and the exaltation of Jesus. Both sides of the V form the Christian's victory through Christ. So it just was kind of cool as I was pre preparing and thinking about what do I want to say this second Sunday of Advent that I went to this passage that has the exaltation, humiliation of Christ, just like we left off in Philippians. So we look at his humiliation. He is a uh, part here, for unto us a child is born. A child is born. There is so much focus in the stable scene and the baby in a manger. And our Christmas decorations at church, ever since I've been here, and probably it started before then, has the manger scene, the, the idea of thinking about the stable and Jesus being born. A child is born. It's a prominent theme for Christians in Christianity uh, um, and a child is born is God's son came down and confined himself into the body of a newborn baby. It's an amazing thought. Everyone loves a new baby, right? Even an old sourpuss loves a new baby. I mean, they can have pickle juice for breakfast and all that, but when the baby shows up, all of a sudden they go, and they start acting different and weird, right? You ever seen people get around babies? They don't care how weird they look. I just think from the baby's perspective, looking up, wow, what was that? You know, because they come and go, you know, all this stuff. And the baby's going, wow, these adults are weird. You know, you ever think about that? Because we all act so weird around him. We don't even act normal. We just get way out there in, in cutesiness, cutesiness, whatever it is, uh, making up words. But babies, we love them because they're pure, because they're innocent. 
They make everyone smile. They make these little cooing noises. And they leave us presents. And nobody even cares. Pick one up and all over you. You know, they just cough all over you. And all this white stuff comes out. And it's just gooey and ugh, and stinks. And we, oh, it's okay. <laughs> Let an adult do that to you and see if you said, oh, it's okay. Right? Babies get by with anything. They can do anything. They're soft. They awaken the maternal and paternal instincts in us. Now, God was someone who came as a child. Unto us a son is born. I mean, he came, a child is born. And we all just kind of got into it. We love that scene. God became someone people could touch. He needed our help. He needed to be bathed. He needed to be cleaned up. He needed to be fed. He needed to do all, this, all these things. And we all get involved. What a way to get everyone involved in salvation history. God surprised the world by sending the Messiah as a child. And everybody, they got involved. Oh, what a cute little kid. Oh, <laughs> And we love that story. Two thousand years later, we are still talking about the babe in the manger. But we can't stay with the babe in the manger, right? Because he grew up and became our Savior on the cross. But the story never gets old. You still read it every year at Christmas? It was tradition at our house, after breakfast, which we had to eat breakfast, you can get up as early as you want, stare at the tree as long as you want, look at all the presents, but you ate breakfast, whenever mom and dad finally got up, and then dad got out the Bible and read the Christmas story. As a little kid, it bothered us a little bit, but not really, because we knew the reason to celebrate Christmas was Jesus Christ. A child is born. A son is given. Unto us, a son is given. See, this baby, the child that was born, is different. Mary was the birth mother, but God was really the source of this gift. A son is given. The birth of a child gets our attention, but the gift of God's son gets our admiration and our worship. I appreciate the church Christmas decorations this year, don't you? We have always had the manger scene, but this fits right in. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And each one of these has something to do about gift. Jesus, our greatest gift, and so on. So if you go around reading these, they're talking about how the son is given unto us. A son is given. And that's what it really is about. Christmas is about the child being born, but it's also about the son being given. And this year's emphasis is important, but too often the emphasis on Christmas is about what I receive. And that's important. God's son is given. We receive Jesus into our lives. But it is warped unless we also receive from God in order to give back, right? And give out. Give back to him through our ministry to others, giving out to them, especially those who don't know him and don't know about his gifts that he has given to us, his indescribable gifts. We have to share that with them. A son is given. God gave himself to the humans he created in order to restore a personal relationship with God that had been destroyed for humans by sin. 
And those that unwrap this gift receive God's daily presence and his enabling power and divine purpose for each day in their lives. Unto us a son is born. Or unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. We're talking about the humiliation of Christ coming down to us. This child who was born, this son who was given, shall be given the responsibility to shoulder the responsibilities of government for the entire human race. Verse 7 prophesied that, that this government would have no end. It would increase. That he would not only take over the throne of David, but, but God's kingdom, the entire kingdom. And he would rule with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. The increase of this government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom in order to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Government will be upon his shoulder. The burden of this government responsibility will be upon his shoulder. I see here the weight and responsibility of providing salvation for all the sins of humankind laid on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. I see here Jesus beaten, bloody, and exhausted, staggering under the load of the cross, dragging it down the streets of Jerusalem, falling down under the heavy load. Why? Because this child, this son has the responsibility of our government, and he carries it upon his shoulder. This is the humiliation of Christ. He came down to earth, the Son of God, who became a child to be born in a manger. He became the bearer of our sins. He became our sacrificial lamb, and he took the responsibility to govern us and to declare us righteous or to declare us sinners at our day of judgment. The government is now on his shoulders because unto us a child is born, unto us a gift, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. The humiliation of Christ. Physician Richard Seltzer wrote in one of his uh, five books, I think he's got um, it's called, this one was called Mortal Lessons, uh, published in 1987. And this surgeon wrote about what he observed in the hospital room, in this particular instance, between a young husband and a young wife after he had performed cancer surgery on the wife's face. Had to remove a tumor. And just quoting his words from this book, he said, I stand by the bed where the young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, one of the muscles of her mouth had been severed. She will be that way from now on. I had followed with the religious fervor the curve of her flesh, I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had cut this little nerve. Her husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed. And together they seem to be in a world all their own in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they? I ask myself. He and this wry mouth that I have made who gaze at and touch each other so generously. The young woman speaks Will my mouth always be like this? Yes, I say, it will. It is because the, because the nerve has been cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. 
all at once, I know who he is. I understand, and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with the divine. Unmindful of me, he bends down to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am so close that I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers. To show her that their kiss still works. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Cancer is gone. Wow. But there's a scar. But the husband says, I'm glad you're here. I will accommodate. Because I want you here. And so he twists his lips to accommodate hers, to make the kiss work. Oh, my friends, God twisted himself to come from heaven as a little baby. I don't know if we understand that. But he allowed his body to be twisted even further on a cross. I don't know if we can understand that. But he wanted us to realize that in spite of the sin and the cancer that is eating in us spiritually, that the love of God still works. Regardless of the scars you bear from sin, you are still beautiful to God. He has twisted himself to meet your spiritual need. He wants a real relationship with you. And if it means twisting into a baby, if it means twisting on a cross, it doesn't matter. He wants you to know you are loved. It may remove sin from your life. It may cause permanent damage. But Jesus loves you. And he will show you how much he loves you. Just look at the cross. He wants a real relationship with you. Unto us. I want to give special emphasis. I titled the message, Unto Us. Because I want us to think about the fact of how Jesus came. How Jesus came. How Jesus came. Unto us. The humiliation of Jesus was for the salvation of us. Jesus came to us. Jesus became us. Jesus died for us. And that's what makes Advent and Christmas so special for Christians, is that this is the story of God giving himself for us. Us. Jesus is the ultimate Christmas gift. Ultimate. If you don't have any gift to give this year, give them Jesus. Share Jesus. That's his humiliation. But then his exaltation, because Jesus went through such humiliation. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, his name will be called, the word name is singular. (laughs) It says all of these four titles that are going to be given combined together refer to Jesus and his actions as king. It's as if they're just one long title to him. It's his name. But you can't just go with those. You have to combine together all the other Old Testament names projected forward to Jesus. The Messiah, 
the coming one, the Alpha and the Omega, and all those things. And then all the words that are given in the New Testament to describe him, the Lamb of God, the, the water of life, the, the bread, the shepherd, the, the I am. His name will be called. And there's probably a hundred different names throughout the Bible attributed to Jesus and his actions as our king. Each throne name given here is made up from two Hebrew words, and each of these titles, along with many others in the Old and New Testament, are assigned to Jesus Christ. Jesus was, is, and will be what no other leader has or will be. Each of these four throne names give us one aspect of his governing ability as the exalted Lord and King. Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful and Counselor can be taken separately. But because of the other royal titles are given as two words, I like putting them together, and we'll consider them the two together, that Jesus is the Wonderful Counselor. Human leaders always surround themselves with advisors. And one of the things on the news is how the presidential advisors are constantly changing. They always do. They last a couple of years and they want to go on to something else less rigorous. Or some of them just don't get along with the current president or whatever the case may be. But there's a big changeover all the time of advising the president. Because why? It's, it's the most important that he gets the proper advice in order to make the decisions that affect our country and our relationship with the world. So every leader has advisors, but Jesus, as the king of kings, needs no outside counsel. Think of that. I know that you know how the world ought to be run, and you probably advise him daily in your prayers, but I'm telling you something, Jesus can handle it pretty well. I know you don't like the way your situation is and you'd like to advise him, but guess what? Jesus is the wonderful counsel. He doesn't need our advice. He's got it pretty well figured out. Think about that for a moment because he is the all-knowing God. He cannot be tricked. He cannot be fooled. He doesn't get confused. He gives the best advice Yes, he does. He has a purpose for everything that he does, and he has a plan for every human life, including yours. And some of the reasons why we get into trouble is because we didn't listen to the right advice from our wonderful counselor. He has unlimited understanding about what is best for life, including ours. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the all-powerful God. Not only does he know everything, but he has the strength to do anything. Nobody is greater and mightier than Jesus. He is unlimited in his ability to see that his will is accomplished in this universe that he has created. He speaks and things happen around the universe. If we surrender to Jesus, if we would surrender to the lordship of the all-knowing, all-powerful God, guess what would happen? He will lead us to victory after victory after victory after victory in our lives. No, it's not going to always be the way I want it to be, but I tell you what, it will be the way he wants it to be. Amen? Because we don't know and understand the purpose every time, but he does. We don't always see the plan. In fact, the Bible says no weapon can be formed that can stand against the might of Jesus Christ. The devil and all demons are already defeated by this mighty warrior, by his victory on the cross. Our eternal victory is assured when we align ourselves with the divine king because he is the all-powerful. But he's also the everlasting father. He's the perfect Father who is the source of all that is good. He is tender. He is faithful. He is wise. He cares about you. Not only does he know everything about you, not only is he all powerful in your behalf, but he also is a Father. 
We struggle with the idea of what a father is, but portrayed as wise and caring, your best interest in heart. Even, even sometimes if he, if he has to come along and, and chasten us a little bit, it's for our own good. He wants to help us. He's our protector. He's our provider. He's our advisor. He is the all-present God. He is available every time we need him, anywhere we need him. He exists in eternity. He never gets tired. He always is loving you and wanting what is best for your life because he's the everlasting Father. And to go along with our candle of peace, he is the Prince of Peace. I'm glad every Christmas we talk about peace. Prince of Peace. He's the all-creative God who can produce only good things. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's everywhere present, and he's all-creative. And one of the things he creates for us is peace. He's got grace, he's got mercy, he's got joy, he's got love. He produces so much because he's a creative God. And he keeps giving and giving and giving and giving. Peace is one of Debbie's favorite words about her relationship with God. The Hebrew term, uh, term here, shalom, means not only a lack of war. And we talk about peace being a lack of war, but no, it's more than that. It is a sense of of rich harmony and well-being. Shalom. Shalom. It's a greeting that they pass to each other. Not only may there be no war in your life, but harmony. May there be harmony. May there be well-being in your life. Ultimately, Jesus will bring peace to the nations when they acknowledge him as the Prince of Peace. And that's going to happen one of these days. His rule always brings wholeness. His rule always brings wellness to those who call him Lord. But more personally, Jesus stands up in our boat. When the storm is on, we say, wake up, Jesus. Don't you care that we perish? And he stands up and he says, peace, be still to the storms of life. How many times has he done that? He comes into our hearts. He brings inner peace Turmoil is the weapon of Satan. Inner peace is the calm assurance Jesus brings to counter the chaos of sin and darkness. And according to verse 11, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Do you see that? The peace Jesus brings should have no end in your life. You should be able to surrender things to the Lord and his peace should come and cover that and you should be able to say, I can make it even through this because I have the peace of God which passes all understanding. If you don't have inner peace today, it's because you're listening to another voice. Because Jesus speaks, peace be still, to our hearts. I'm not talking about the storms outside. Sometimes those don't get controlled. But he can control the storms inside. If we will surrender them to him. Inner peace. When you obey God, Jesus always brings peace. As the old hymn states, there's a deep, settled peace in my soul. There's a deep, settled peace in my soul. Though the billows of sin near me roll, he abides, Christ abides. Peace. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above, sweep over my spirit, forever I pray. 
In fathomless billows of love. There's a ton of songs that talk about peace. Why is this? Because it's something that Jesus brings. He is the prince of peace. If you're a Christian today and you're being overwhelmed by the turmoil, that is not God's will for your life. He wants to bring peace internally. Now, the humiliated and exalted Jesus is our wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's exalted. That's who he is today. Advent is the time for Christians to anticipate and appreciate the arrival of Jesus. If we miss the significance of Advent, of the coming, then we miss the meaning of Christmas. And it's only, what, 10 days away. If you had missed the meaning of Advent, then you've missed the meaning of Christmas. Why don't you make this Advent the season when you allow Jesus to come into your life and change you into the man or the woman or the child that God designed for you to be? Allow it to be different this year. 16 days away. Is this going to be a different Advent? Making this a real Christmas? Jesus is your gift this Christmas. Will you accept this gift this morning? And if you have accepted it, Will you give this gift to someone else? Unto us, a child is born. Unto us, the son is given. Jesus came unto us. Have you let Jesus come into you? As they come to lead us in a song, we're going to open the altar up. It's family altar time. Let's talk to the Lord about making this Advent, these next 16 days, the best days so we can have the best Christmas ever. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for sharing with us again the real reason why we have Advent. Reminding us, Lord, that Jesus came, yes, but he came to die so that we could have salvation, sanctification, and eternal life. And Lord, we just want to thank you for this gift. And Lord, we don't want to be selfish with it, but we as a church and as individuals want to share this gift with others. We pray for missionaries to go and be with those that are out, out, out beyond our, our sphere of influence that we cannot reach for Jesus. But other people are praying for us to be missionaries for those that live in our area of influence. Lord, we cannot deny our responsibility to also share the gift with those around us. And Lord, we have family members, we have friends, we have those right here in town that need Jesus. Lord, may this be the Advent (laughs) when we remember the gift keeps on giving and we share the good news of Jesus with our families. Thank you, Lord, for this time together to remind us of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will just now make us the most encouraging people for the next week and a half, two weeks. (laughs) Lord, we just need you to do that. Two weeks, Lord, to share Jesus with others in the grocery line and in the mall and wherever we go, Lord, that Jesus would just shine forth and people will see that there's another reason for Christmas. And it's more than Santa. It's Jesus. So, Lord, we surrender to you today. 
And we thank you. It's our time to worship you and praise you because of what you have done. Our gift to you right now this morning is to lift up Jesus Christ. Our gift to you right now is to say, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. We exalt you. We will live for you. And when the time comes, we will die for you. Because you are Jesus, the Savior of the world. And thank you, Lord. We love you. We bow before you today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Maybe seated. We hope you enjoyed this sermon. If you're looking for a church in the Brazil, Indiana area, the Brazil Church of the Nazarene invites you to join us as we seek him, celebrate him, and serve him. Each Sunday morning, we have Sunday school at 9 a.m. and a worship service at 10 a.m. During worship, we have We Worship for preschool age kids and a children's service for elementary students. On Wednesday nights, we have a prayer service and activities for teens. For this information, news, a schedule of events, and much more, be sure to visit us online at brazilnaz.com. That's B-R-A-Z-I-L-N-A-Z.com. Thank you, and God bless.